Japan is cool. It's just got an awesome culture. The calligraphy, the kimonos, the ramen, and the kodos, it's all super neat. Except, none of those things were originally Japanese. Those all came from a different country, often perceived as being a lot less cool. Those all came from China. In this video, I'm going to be explaining my biggest issue with Japan. It's not actually the fault of anybody in Japan, at least not for the past 80 years. It's just something that sort of surrounds them and leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I'm going to be talking about how many of the things we think of as being cool about Japan are actually more from China, and that because of censorship in the Chinese government, Japan gets credit for creating a bunch of things that they didn't actually have much hand in inventing. Now, to be clear, Japan has legitimately created a ton of great things over the years. Sushi and okonomiyaki are both Japanese originals, and they're delicious. And Japan's iconic katanas and samurai are both completely unique to the islands. I'm not trying to suggest that Japan doesn't have any interesting, unique culture, and it's not like Japan is the only one borrowing things from other places. Europeans do it to each other all the time, and Americans spread culture from all over the world. Cooperative democracies are like a jazz ensemble, all riffing off each other's themes, for better or sometimes for worse. The difference is, most European nations have ripped stuff from other developed, democratic countries with freedom of speech. This isn't true for China. China's government is incredibly repressive, forcing strict rules on what art can and can't be made. If it goes against the will of the CCP, you can't make your movie. And of the small percentage of art that they deem acceptable, only a small percentage of that is shared significantly outside the country. What was for decades the largest nation on earth barely has a cultural presence outside of money and jokes about the government. So what's the issue? Basically, Chinese citizens don't have the freedom to express themselves artistically, which leads to people around the world not recognizing the interesting parts about its history and culture. Because the Chinese government doesn't allow free expression and the few things that do get made rarely leave the country, people don't know anywhere near as much about Chinese culture as they do about South Korea and Japan. And I mean the old and the new stuff, the stories both of journeys to the West and life in modern Shanghai. I cannot count the number of times I've heard somebody mention how much they love all the unique food from Japan, and then proceed to talk about their addiction to ramen and miso, two soups that originated in China. It's not like Japan adopted them and then China just stopped eating them, they're still common in China today. Folks will talk about how unique kimonos are, seemingly not realizing that China has those too, and actually invented them. And the same is true for green tea, kanji, pagodas, kodos, and a bunch of other things that are basically straight up adopted from China. The reason people so often don't seem to realize this isn't the fault of modern Japan. The problem is that, because China is so closed off and repressive, it's very hard for people to learn much about it. YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitch, and Twitter are all banned in China, so there's no chance you'll stumble upon people showing off their cool neighborhoods or their local cuisine. And even if you could get past the barrier of not having access to each other's social media platforms, there are few bilingual people in China, so barely anything gets translated into English, and definitely not Spanish, Hindi, or Portuguese. There's also not as much of an incentive, since there's no good way to distribute Chinese media across the world, and there's already a huge market at home. This is a big reason why Chinese comics are so rare compared to those from Japan, despite China being 12 times bigger. And the same is true for other countries. Despite Russia being easily the largest European nation, its biggest movie is an animated kids film that didn't even break the 100 million mark, and basically made all of its money off of Russian viewers. Compare that to a country like France, which despite being half the size, manages to create movies like The Untouchables, which make over 400 million US dollars and have broad appeal not just in Europe, but in East Asia, North America, and Latin America too. Even Spain consistently outperforms Russia. Censoring your people just isn't a good strategy for making popular media. It's also worth noting that despite India being the same size as China, it still produces way more movies for the international market. The top three money-making movies from India are Dangal, Bahubali 2, and RRR, and all of those got decently big across the world. RRR also won the Oscar for Best Original Song, and as a person who has watched the movie, I can confirm that it is wild. Seriously, it's called Natu Natu, it's on YouTube, and you've got to watch it. And Dangal, the biggest Indian movie, ironically actually made most of its money in China. I'm guessing most of you watching can name at least two or three Indian movies, and have probably watched at least one, which is more than most people can do with the other massive super country. Plus, while India isn't super influential yet, 80% of their population still lives in poverty, so I'm going to hold them to a different standard than China, which is generally developed. They have the resources to make big movies. India usually doesn't. 
You rarely see any cool movies that make you want to learn more about Chinese culture, and if you do, there's a two-thirds chance it was made in America. The few things that do get made in China rarely see the light of day outside the country, and they definitely don't get advertisements like Squid Game did. South Korea does a ton to promote their media worldwide, and Japan does too, but China's never been big on that. According to Box Office Mojo, The Wandering Earth, the fifth highest grossing Chinese movie of all time, made $698 million at the box office. Of that frankly ridiculous amount of money, just $7 million, or barely 1%, were from places outside of China. And it's even more extreme for other movies. Wolf Warrior 2 is the second highest grossing Chinese movie, and of its $870 million in box office revenue, only $4 million came from anywhere outside the country. It's notable that both of these movies are very nationalistic, which is a big reason they could get made. The number one, Battle at Lake Chongjin, is two. It's a film funded by the CCP Propaganda Department, yes, that's their real name, about the heroic North Koreans managing to fight off the US during the Korean War. It's so clearly a state-funded propaganda film that it's not even funny. None of these were released in any significant capacity outside the country. The only thing that people see about China is stuff in the news about how big their economy is, or how they're banning hip-hop. It makes the culture seem so absurdly uncool. When people hear the name Japan, the first things they think about are anime, crazy light shows, and beautiful shots of cherry blossoms and Mount Fuji. When they hear South Korea, they think of Seoul, K-pop, and awesome TV shows. And despite many of those things also existing in China, when people hear China, they think of Xi Jinping, a bunch of stuffy businessmen looking at stocks, and Uyghur concentration camps. And if you're lucky, maybe the Great Wall in a 400-year-old painting or two. Despite being the only one to have a part of the government called the Propaganda Department, China is remarkably bad at presenting itself positively to other countries. Like, let's have a thought experiment real quick. Let's say there wasn't any government censorship in China aside from the obvious age restrictions and things like that. And let's say any Chinese-made content was readily available on websites like Netflix, Crunchyroll, or hell, maybe a Chinese equivalent that you can get easily around the world. Even if Chinese people were only making a fifth of the content per capita that Japanese people were, there would still be twice as much Chinese media as Japanese stuff. It would total out to three times the amount of anime. I mean, think of it, people. Think of the world we could be living in. I honestly think it's kind of tragic, not just for the Chinese artists who can't freely express themselves, but for us. Think of how much great stuff we're missing out on, how many fantastic movies and shows aren't being made due to government censorship, how much music is never distributed outside the country. All of these factors change the way China is perceived in the West. People don't think of it as being cool in the same way that they do with Japan and South Korea. People acknowledge all the interesting things about Japan because they see them in the media they consume, but not China, because in the heads of many folks in the West, the Red Dragon is primarily defined by authoritarianism and money. And you know, that's fair, because they don't produce any significant cultural exports. That's why I had to call this video my problem with Japan, and not my problem with China, because if I did, everyone would think I was just complaining about the government, and no one would click on it. And I mean, I am complaining about the government, but there's a lot more to this video than that. If Mao hadn't taken over, things would have been different. How do I know? Because in the 1900s, they used to be. There's this concept in international relations called soft power. The traditional method of influencing other nations, military might, is called hard power. Soft power refers to everything else. Modern day Japan is a master of soft power. It is an influential economy, huge games, comics, and animation industries, and its culture is loved and spread all over the world. People everywhere, from France to the USA to Mexico to India, love Japanese culture because of all the media they're fond of. China has virtually no soft power. It is a large economy, sure, but it has practically no cultural exports. There aren't really any cool Chinese shows on Netflix, no fun video games, all the famous actors are from Hong Kong, and I could count their international blockbusters on one hand. 
but things were different back in the old days. Before the 1900s, China was the cultural center of all of East Asia. They were an absolute god of soft power, everyone in the Sinosphere emulating the styles and traditions of the Middle Kingdom. Japan, Korea, and Vietnam all adopted Chinese characters because that's what everything was written in. Mandarin Chinese was the lingua franca of East Asia, with the vast majority of religious and scientific texts being written with the Han characters. Chinese Confucian and Taoist beliefs spread across the Sinosphere, influencing the governing style of the nations. Kimonos and Ao Lin, the traditional dress of Japan and Vietnam, came from Hanfu, the ancient clothing of China. Chinese architecture changed the very look of the cities in Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, adopting the symmetrical rectangular designs of the Tang Dynasty. Instruments like the pipa and guzheng went to Japan and became the biwa and koto. The Chinese invention of chopsticks spread across Asia and they became the primary utensil across not just the Sinosphere, but parts of South and Southeast Asia too. Not only did Vietnam and Korea adopt the Chinese lunar calendar, but they started celebrating Lunar New Year as well, using the same traditions that began in China. Chinese painting styles, focusing more on establishing a vibe and a message as opposed to European realism, enormously influenced the art of the other nations. In fact, Japan didn't have any noodle dishes until the 800s when China introduced them. It's notable that the same didn't happen much in reverse. Japan, Korea, and Vietnam didn't influence the Chinese dynasties all that much, and that's probably because while China often had almost 100 million potential artists, musicians, and poets, the others didn't break 10. China was just really big and really creative. It's a little hard to understate how unbelievably influential China used to be. It was the center of literature, fashion, art, trade, innovation, religion, food, music, dance, martial arts, and architecture in East Asia for thousands of years. I'm not trying to understate the impact Japanese, Vietnamese, and Koreans had. They created a lot of stuff too. But China was such a cultural powerhouse for such a long time that it's just not that comparable. And it wasn't only East Asia. China was at the forefront of global technology, and their art was admired everywhere, from the castles of Spain to the palaces of India. They were about as close as the world ever got to a superpower before industrialization. This only really started to change in the 1750s, when China completely blocked itself off from the outside world. They began to stagnate technologically, falling behind the other nations. That the Middle Kingdom had developed a sense of superiority, that they were the greatest civilization in history, and that these annoying Europeans trying to trade with them were merely attempting to get a bit of that glory. It really isn't surprising that China developed an ego, considering not only was it calling itself the center of the universe, but everyone around it was too. For the next few hundred years, Europe gradually took over more and more land in Asia. The USA eventually knocked Japan out of its own isolationist run, leading it to industrialize faster than any nation in the history of the world. Japan then became a colonial power itself, taking over Korea and Taiwan. Meanwhile, China stayed the same, having barely noticed. China finally opened up to the outside world in 1911, when the Xinhai Revolution brought an end to over 2,000 years of empire. The people were tired of iron-fisted tyrants and gullible child emperors, and the ruling Manchu people, who had been forcing the Han majority to adopt their cultures and customs. The citizens rebelled and attempted to transform China into a democratic republic. It was unstable and unfair, and this terrorist called Mao Zedong was starting to get uncomfortably popular, but with some reform and social change, it could work. It was a newborn country and needed some time to get its footing. And then Japan invaded them. When Japan took Manchuria, the narrative completely shifted. While the Kuomintang were busy trying to deal with Mao, Mao and his party declared war on Japan. This rallied enormous numbers of people to the CCP, frustrated by Kuomintang inaction after a massive invasion had taken a huge portion of Chinese land. General Chiang Kai-shek continued to focus on dealing with Mao, but it just wasn't working. And then, nine years later, Japan invaded them again. This is the event that ended up hamstringing China, the one thing that Japan is responsible for in all this. In 1937, Japan declared war and fully invaded China. The Republic of China signed a peace treaty with Mao, realizing that they had a common enemy in the genocidal and expansionist Japanese empire. The Japanese army saw the Chinese as less than human and treated them as such. Japanese soldiers killed Chinese people in mass executions, 
burying their bodies in enormous graves. The Kuomintang and Mao, now allies, fought back, and with help from the US, the Empire of Japan eventually collapsed. In the eyes of the populace, Mao had gone from a terrorist to a war hero. Now significantly more popular and in command of almost one million soldiers, Mao easily overthrew the republic, establishing the People's Republic of China. He shut the country down again, blocking out everyone else for 20 years. While Japan was creating television and discovering nuclear power, China's industrialization projects were far less successful, leading to tens of millions of deaths from famine. Mao wasn't delivering on his promises of liberation, he was becoming the new master. This is the part of my problem with Japan that is actually its fault. Not only were they genocidal during World War II, but Mao also would have almost certainly never risen to power without Japanese invasion. Without the troops and popular support Mao had after fighting Imperial Japan, he would be remembered only as a radical terrorist. But there's one fascinating thing that we got out of World War II. One place I've purposely neglected to mention until now, that offers a glimpse into what China would be like with free speech. After the Chinese Civil War, the Kuomintang fled en masse to a little island off the coast of China. It was part of the Republic, easy to defend and with enough space for a few million refugees. Taiwan's population doubled as huge numbers of people fled from the fighting on the mainland. The island effectively remained under martial rule for the next four decades, only finally loosening up in the early 90s. They had their first democratic elections in 1992, and their first democratic presidential election in 1996. Ever since then, it's been one of the most consistently free countries on Earth. Despite being a very small country, with barely half the population of Canada, it's had a fairly outsized cultural influence. A lot of popular Chinese food, especially fast food, was invented in Taiwan. They were the creators of bubble tea, Mongolian barbecue, popcorn chicken, pineapple cakes, gua pao, small sausage and big sausage, which is the official name, iron eggs, shaved ice mountains, Taiwanese bento, instant noodles, and general so's chicken. I've tried the majority of these, and while most are extremely unhealthy, they're also very delicious. They were the first country to have cat cafes, even before Japan, and have been incredibly influential in the Chinese music scene. A huge portion of big Chinese language musical artists come from Taiwan, despite the island only having 2% the population of China. This might be a bit of a weird measurement, but there are also way more big YouTube channels based in Taiwan than China, and that's a platform that half the world sees. They're also significantly more progressive than China. There's this old Chinese concept, popularized by Confucius, of harmony and societal order being important above basically anything else. And what's interesting is that both China and Taiwan work off this concept, just in very different ways. China is iron-fisted, stamping down on anybody expressing anti-government opinions. Anything outside the norm has to be silenced. The CCP has been working to destroy the cultures of Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Mongolians for decades now, and they've become notorious for censoring LGBT content in the media. China has virtually locked itself off from any migrants or foreign workers, despite the workforce shrinking every year. They've tried to stem the flow of any Western influence, or any outside influence at all for that matter, in an attempt to preserve a hypothetical pure Chinese culture that never really existed. Taiwan, as a democracy, took the opposite approach. They've maintained societal order by trying to make everybody, even the minorities, happy. Back in 2019, Taiwan became the first Asian country to allow gay marriage, a huge step forward that only one other country in the continent has joined them in so far. Things have been improving for the historically discriminated against indigenous peoples of Formosa, as Taiwanese embrace it as part of the island's unique identity. They have a decently sized migrant population, 780,000 people, mostly from Southeast Asia, coming to the country as foreign workers. This means that Taiwan has a higher immigrant population than any other East Asian nation. They're known for being generally more accepting than other Asian nations. Still not great, but the most you'll probably get as a black person are weird looks and ignorance like you might find in Scandinavia, instead of the societal hatred in China. And this isn't to say that Taiwan is fully representative of what China would be like as a democracy, the island has a unique culture that only really exists there. It feels a lot more Polynesian than most of China, partially due to the influence of the Aboriginal people living in Taiwan, and partially due to it being a tropical island. Plus, in terms of Chinese immigrants to the island, the vast majority of Taiwanese are descended from people from this bit of China, so the Chinese stuff on the island feels very South Chinese. 
there's not as much from the fairly different Sichuan Basin, Northern Plains, and Manchuria. And this isn't even mentioning Hong Kong. While they're technically part of China, they're a democracy with a degree of relative freedom away from the government. They've been huge in the movies industry, creating hits like Kung Fu Hustle, Shaolin Soccer, and House of Flying Daggers. They were also the home country of the Police Story and Ip Man series, or as I like to call it, Intellectual Property Man. These are all movies based on Chinese martial arts that have gotten pretty popular worldwide, and are proof that people all across the planet love wuxia and martial arts movies. And in terms of popularity in the movies, Chinese and Taiwanese immigrants to America and non-Chinese filmmakers who just think China is cool have made enormously influential films based on the culture. The Kung Fu Panda series is a parody of traditional wuxia films, being both very funny and incredibly emotionally powerful, and is generally agreed to be one of the best animated trilogies of all time. Turning Red and Everything Everywhere All at Once are two recent, extremely well-received movies about struggling as an immigrant family in Canada and the USA, respectively. And Shang-Chi is generally agreed to be one of the better things to come out of Marvel recently. They're popular and they're good, but they're not coming from China. And most other Chinese cultural exports aren't either. I think if I have to boil it down to one thing, my problem is this. It seems like the only way to get Chinese culture in the West, the new stuff and the old stuff, is for it to either go through a tiny city-state, a country that doesn't even want to be associated with China, or the stuff that Korea and Japan adopted. All of the cool parts of China are either going to be omitted or blend into the background. We in the West are never going to get a quality show about the War of the Three Kingdoms or the Taiping Rebellion. We'll never have a good comedy sitcom set in Shanghai or Guangzhou. We'll never see Chinese songs break the top 40, and we'll maybe have one hit Chinese video game a decade. It seems like all games and animated works from Asia will forever be based on Japan and only Japan, and that's really sad. My problem with Japan isn't with the country itself. It's that every time I look at something they've made, it reminds me of what could have been. What China could have created if things have gone a bit differently, if the CCP had never taken over. When I look at shows like Demon Slayer, loved for their cool visuals and cultural uniqueness, I think of all of the millions of beautiful stories locked behind an authoritarian government that will never get to see the light of day. And that's just really sad. All right, everyone, it's time for me to say goodbye. I hope that this video didn't come across as me like bashing Japan or anything. I really do think that their stuff is interesting. I just get very frustrated when stuff that's very much Chinese in origin gets completely credited to Japan. It, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's just kind of depressing. That's it. I really enjoyed researching this video. Thank you, goodbye, and I'll see you sometime in the future.